Hey, keto freaks. You picked a really good episode to listen to today. Dr. Jason Fung is with us, but before we talk to him, I want to tell you about KetoFest 2017. Richard Morris and I, along with some other well-known wonks in the world of low-carb, high-fat, ketogenics, and fasting, are going to turn the entire town of New London, Connecticut, keto, for a weekend. The weekend of July 14th through the 16th in 2017, to be exact, KetoFest is not a conference. Conferences are for professionals. Festivals are for people. There will be lectures, yes, but also a town full of keto food. We're turning all the restaurants keto. We're talking about fathead pizza from a brick oven. Also, a pig roast, music, cooking lessons, bike tours, walking tours, lifting and fitness lessons, wine tastings. Oh yeah, that's more like it. On Friday night, I'm throwing an exclusive dinner party at my house, which we'll use as a fundraiser for KetoFest. On Saturday, there'll be lectures at the Guard Theater. Ivor Cummins and Dr. Jeff Gerber will be there. Eric Westman said he'd like to come and speak, and more are signing up all the time. Saturday night is the Meat Fest outside on the Parade Plaza by the water. After dinner, we'll have a showing of The Widowmaker on the Guard Theater's 60-foot screen. On Sunday, we'll do all the other stuff in the town. We'll have the cooking lessons at the Spark Makerspace Kitchen, the bike tours, the walking tours, and all that. Doesn't that sound like fun? If you're interested in hearing more about it as plans take shape, go to KetoFest.com and sign up for notifications. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 70 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 70 pounds and I've completely turned my health around. This show is a document of both my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for over two years in ketosis, and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. We have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. So we also share some of the great food that we eat on this diet, and every episode, both of us share a recipe for an essential keto meal that we eat regularly. So, Richard, let's start episode number 26, The Obesity Code. The Obesity Code. Maybe it's the Obesity Coders, because we're... Okay. Okay. Or the obese coders, not anymore. The, yeah, the the once were obese coders. Hey, um, we're just gonna let Jason come right in here. And hi, Jason. Hey guys, how are you? We just want you to hang out with us while we do the rest of the stupid things on our show. Because if you've got a comment, we you know that's gold for us. So yeah. So, well, congratulations on your progress. I mean, it's uh, you know great to hear these sort of uh, stories because as medical doctors. You know, I see lots of these sorts of people, and unfortunately, they never gain control of their health the way you guys have. And this is the whole point of uh, podcasts like this, is to help people understand that, uh, you know, yes, it is possible, and, you know, to show them how to do it, right? And that that's that's terrific, what you guys are doing. And you must, in your practice, hear these same stories over and over and over again. Absolutely. And it's very gratifying to see because uh, what's interesting is that these sort of things where type 2 diabetes kind of goes in reverse is something that people are told is impossible, right? It can't be done. And 
You know, in fact, many doctors have given up trying to coach their patients how to lose weight because they try it and they see that they don't lose weight. Of course, they don't understand that the strategy that they're using, which is cutting calories, low fat diets, is really a very difficult way to lose weight. So when people don't lose weight, they think that it's like an impossible task, right? Because their strategy, which is the one that's taught to them and everybody else, right? Count your calories, exercise some more. It really works very poorly. The, the, the failure rate is in excess of 99%. And that's kind of uh, what the statistics show. But also our randomized control trials show the same thing. So uh, when you try to make people lose weight with calorie cutting and low fat diets and exercise, it actually doesn't work at all. So we've proven that over and over and nobody needs to be convinced. Everybody's tried it and it doesn't work for anybody, right? So none of us has been able to successfully do it. And yet that's the advice that we continue to give. And that doesn't make any sense. And that's why I wrote the obesity code is really to go over some of the um, basics in terms of what causes weight loss because nobody ever thinks about that very hard right when they think about what causes weight loss they think well what causes weight gain well it's calories right well that's the wrong answer because if you think it's about calories then you're going to cut your calories and we've done that and it's failed so it's not about the calories right it's something uh different it's actually a hormonal uh, change one of the uh, main hormones involved is insulin and ketogenic diets like you guys follow one of the main things that is advantageous is that it reduces insulin quite a bit, right? Yeah. Well, we're going to talk some more about that. But uh, Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Yeah, we do have one. We mentioned that uh, muscle weighs more than fat. and Well, that's not precisely correct. Yeah. Muscle's really more dense than fat. That is the correct way to say it. That is the correct way to say it. One liter of muscle weighs more than one liter of fat, so that's true. But it's equally true to say one pound of fat takes up more space than one pound of muscle. So if you aren't losing weight on the scale, grab a tape measure and see if you've lost inches around your belly because that's fat loss and muscle gain. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, before we get back to the talk about insulin with uh, Dr. Fung, how did you do this week? Yeah, I've actually had a really good week. This I've had my quarterly uh, doctor visit, and I get a blood draw three, uh, four times a year, every three months, and I get the basics, you know, HbA1c to work out where my glucose control is at, and then I get a, a lipid panel. And uh, this time, for the second time ever, I got my fasting insulin. Now, you remember three months ago, well, I've been on the ketogenic diet for over two years, and three months ago, my fasting insulin was 20 milli units per liter mm. uh, which is quite high i mean that this is this is a, a high fasting insulin and the analysis that the path lab put on my documentation was mild insulin resistance detected mm. the only thing i've changed in the 3 months was i've been doing extended fasting once a month i fast for 3 days 72 hours and then i do uh, endurance cycling so i i go out and cycle for about 100 kilometers mm. and I, I normally ride every week anyway over 50 kilometers a week endurance cycling but uh, on those fasting days i fa i ride extra long and that was the only thing that I changed in the three months. My fasting insulin has dropped to normal range. I'm now 13.7 insulin. And in fact, the path lab, when the, when my doctor signed me up for, uh, for my diagnostics, she obviously put in uh, all of my details, in fact, including that I was a type 2 diabetic. Well, the path lab actually came back and said, this guy's not type 2 diabetic. You know, they basically came normal insulin, uh, no insulin resistance detected. Wow. So it was almost a passive aggressive way of trying to <laughs> trying to tell my doctor she obviously had gotten the wrong diagnosis when she confirmed me as being type 2 diabetic. That's outstanding. Yeah. And plus my HDL went up and my Triglycerides went down. I'm like, um, I'm 2.1 uh, tr trigs over HDL. So I'm so close to getting to that ideal range. So I went out, I posted this on Facebook, of course, and already there's been like 320 shares. So the thing's yeah. gone viral. <laughs> so, but uh, so no, I've had a wonderful week. I've had a great week. H how was your week? Oh, uh, it was good. I have perfected the art of getting back on the horse. <laughs> uh, you fell off again uh, you know this was last week I talked about it I had started with some mm. ham salad at a deli 
And Jason, you probably hear this stuff all the time. You know, you're trying to cut carbs to, you know, for people like us with deranged metabolisms, try to cut carbs and and then some sneaks in somehow and you get a little bit of hunger, keep it at bay all day. And then evening comes around and it sort of rears its ugly head and, oh, I'll just have one chicken wing. Oh, no, these chicken wings are breaded. Oh, no. So, you know, the next thing you know, you're starving and shoving all sorts of food in your mouth and and uh, take on a lot of water weight. So anyway, I I got right back on the horse. Yeah. And that's the key. Right. And, uh, you know, that that's that's what that's what a lot of happens to a lot of people. And that's why we, we set up our program the way we do, because there is that kind of long term follow up, because the last thing you want is to you know kind of get off and then lose control of it so then that's why we follow people actually uh fairly regularly even after they've kind of lost the weight because it kind of creeps up on you and then you can catch it quickly before it becomes a real problem to get back on right so i noticed that um uh, i I read your book the obesity code richard has too and we've Mm -hmm. read your web series on uh why people get fat and all of that and in many, many parts, including Fasting Myths, which is always great fun to read. You're an amazing writer. And uh, I went back and reread your FAC, your Fasting FAC, on the Diet Doctor website. And I noticed that a lot of your answers to the questions, and a lot of the questions are, you know, help me, what do I do, right? Um, a lot of your answers tend to be very common sense, <laughs> very much, um, well, I, you know, there's so many different ways to approach this and you try them all and do what works for you. It seems like maybe half of the answers were that because people want to know, should I do this type of IF or extended fasting or? Well, we actually individualize it uh, in, the, in the same way, right? So we start off with what we recommend and then we, we tailor it according to how people feel and what fits into their life and what doesn't fit into their life and how they feel about it. Exactly. And that's the thing. I think that we've made everything so much more difficult than it needs to be. That is, um, you know, and, and even the low carb sites, they get this, Oh, you have to be, you know, 30% and not 31%, right? I'm like, okay, guys, you know, that's not the real issue here. Nobody counts it to that precision, right? And there's this idea almost that, you know, the more precise you can get, the better you are. But it's like, okay, well, what works for me may be completely different than what works for you, right? And there's nothing wrong with it in, in, in either case, right? If you follow one diet and it do, does you very good, then you should do it. But it doesn't mean that it'll do me the same good. Mm-hmm. And we see this all the time. And I think that part of the problem is that there are lots of different uh, people out there giving advice. Uh, but you have to really see who works with people day in and day out with obesity, right? So there are people out there who are essentially scientists, obesity researchers or whatever, um, which is great, but you know, there's science and then there's what happens in the real world. Right. I mean, it's just like software, sure. right? There's the way it's supposed to work and then no. there's the way it does work. Right. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. And there's Windows, right? And we uh, all know what happens with Windows. So the, the the thing is that Windows is supposed to work great, right? But it doesn't always. And mm-hmm. that's the same thing with diets, right? So if you have no practical experience with working with people, for so let's take an example of fasting. Very few people use it as a therapeutic tool, right? And I have no idea anymore why not. Yeah. It does a lot of good. But then there are people who scream from the sidelines, oh, women can't do it. Well, you know, there are literally millions of women, Muslims, Buddhists, all these women throughout all of human history who have fasted, right? And they didn't die. And the cave women, when it was winter and they didn't eat, they didn't die. They had children later on, right? So there are people screaming from the sidelines, oh, you can't do this. And women in fasting is one of the biggest myths. I get questions about that all the time. Oh, women can't fast because there's some website that said they can't fast. And I'm thinking, okay, so I have like hundreds of women fasting and millions of women have fasted throughout history. And yet you, with your experience of zero people, and you've read two studies on rats, have decided that 
women shouldn't fast. And you get featured on a prominent website like Mark's Daily Apple, and all of a sudden you're telling women not to fast. So here's one of the weight loss tools that we have which is in fact one of the most powerful tools that we have and you've thrown it in the garbage all because some guy has decided after you know after reading a couple of rat studies that they shouldn't do it mm. right it's <laughs> ridiculous or oh it burns muscle and you get this all the time too right oh, yeah. it burns muscle it burns muscle it burns muscle and i always think well so let me ask you, how many hundreds of patients do you have who are fasting and how many complain of muscle loss? Well, I'll tell you, I have a thousand patients who have fasted hmm. and I have exactly zero people who have complained of muscle loss. So if I had the first one tomorrow, which I don't know if I will, then that will be a prevalence of one in a thousand or 0.01%, meaning 99.99% of people do this with no problem. Yes, I understand. If your body fat is very low, you will burn muscle, but that's not what I'm talking about, right? I never treat those patients with fasting. I treat people who have a BMI usually over, always over 25 usually over 30, right? So, so what I love about your book and your theories and you're getting into it now, you know, you say stuff like, why would you chop wood and store it all winter? And then when it's time to build a fire, you throw the sofa on the fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the thing that strikes me about your approach is that it's, it's very Eastern philosophically, which is that... You know, in the West, we have sort of gotten handed down this patriarchal kind of, um, you know, from maybe the ancient Greeks who were all about, uh, you know, the mind and the intellect and the power of the triumph of the intellect over the body and over the, you know, this kind of thing, which permeated itself into the Bible. You know, we get dominion over all the animals and, you know, we're above uh, above animals, right? We've risen above them and therefore we can control them. We can control nature and all of this. And Eastern philosophy is very much the opposite. It's, hey, you know what? Life happens to you. And, you know, how you work within the, the existing world, you can't change it. You can't change nature. You can only learn how to live in harmony with it. And, and I think this is essentially your, your philosophy here. It's like, you know, you, if you had to decide between millions of years of evolution perfecting our bodies the way that we've that have gotten us to here and you know some drug or some new therapy or or some controlled you know you have to have this many grams of whatever you know you'll always side with evolution yeah and that's the thing too um what you're saying is that you've got this kind of people who say this is the way it should be and therefore you should listen to me but it's ridiculous again because think about it if you decide to do fasting and it really, you know, your body feels worse and you hate it and it feels like crap, and so then don't do it, right? It's a tool. Sure. You can use it or you cannot use it, right? I don't care, right? <laughs> but to throw it in the garbage and never use it and proclaim from your kind of ivory tower that nobody should ever fast because you're going to go into starvation mode, women are going to die, mm. and you're going to burn through all your muscle. And then you, you, you've kind of lost the ability to even use that for people who would have benefited tremendously. And I see yeah. it every day, right? I see lots of people who benefit from it. Uh, and, and those are people who would not have, right? They would have been told to eat a, you know, cut 500 calories a day and they would never have lost any weight and they would have gone on to yep. insulin and mm. type, do diabetes and stuff, right? And this is the thing is that it doesn't make any sense. And then you go back and you say, well, what is their actual qualification to do so? And, and Nicholas Nassim Taleb has a great uh, analogy. He said, basically, these are the people who are lecturing birds how to fly, right? So I have a huge practice of people who fast, and yet people are telling me that I should or shouldn't tell people to fast based on their three or four studies that they read and no practical experience. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, why am I listening to you? <laughs> and this is what I usually come up with is I don't listen to you because you have no experience and I have experience and therefore, you know, you can think whatever you want. I'm not pushing it that everybody must do it. Yeah. There is a short list of people that shouldn't fast, yeah. right? 
Absolutely. And, and people who do fast, who might benefit, but really find it too hard, you're never going to do it again, right? But right. what you have to understand is that it's an option for people and lots of people find it very beneficial and much easier than actual dieting in a traditional sort of sense, right? And for those people, if it works better for them, then they should definitely use it. But if it doesn't work better for them, then they shouldn't use it, right? And, mm-hmm, yeah. you know, it's, why not? Why do we not let let people do it, right? But I don't force it on people, yeah. right? And that's the difference, right? That's the Eastern philosophy yeah. uh, or the Eastern sort of approach that, hey, you know, we can do it. Like you might like chocolate and I might like vanilla and there's nothing wrong with that, sure. right? Whereas the other people are, oh, you must eat vanilla. It's so good for you. And it's like, but I hate vanilla. Like, no, you don't. Mm. You love vanilla, right? And like, no, I don't. Right? You will love <laughs> vanilla, damn it. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, my dog knows more than Kevin Hall about insulin. Oh. <laughs> my, my, seriously, I've got to do a blog post about this because Bluebell, my, my dog, had an adrenalectomy. And so she had a very complicated hormonal scenario. But one of the things it did was it tipped – her pancreas over the edge and she became a uh, canine diabetic, which uh, basically means she was making no insulin. So we had to inject it for her. And she started putting on weight and the vet said to us, I want you to restrict her feeding. So we gave her precisely the same exercise, precisely the same food. We were giving her 200 grams morning and evening of kangaroo mints and that was all she ate. Uh, we were giving her 100 units per day of insulin, which is a lot for a small dog. And she was 33 kilograms in size. Well, they did a glucose curve and she, her nadir was going uh, below safe range. So they had us bring her insulin down. So now remember, she's having the same food for the entire time. She's doing exactly the same exercise. Calories in and calories out are identical. We're giving her 100 units of insulin. They ask us to drop her insulin. Eventually, we dropped it down to 30 units a day of insulin. Can you imagine what happened? She dropped six kilos of weight, Mm. you know, Mm. same calories in, same calories out. The difference is the hormonal milieu. And, and, you know, so my dog Bluebell knows more and more about insulin than Kevin Hall, apparently. The thing that that always gets me is that, uh, and it's not so much uh, Kevin Hall, but the, the whole thing about insulin is very interesting. Because if you think that insulin is the major player in weight gain, and obviously I do, you know, I wrote the whole book about it, right? Sure. But it's very easy to say, okay, well, if I want to test that hypothesis, then give insulin and see if people gain weight. Mm -hmm. Then they do. And then the corollary of that is take away insulin. Do they lose weight? And they do as well, right? You have type 2 diabetics or whatever diabetics. On insulin, you take that insulin away, they lose weight. So it's like, okay, that's your question. Does insulin cause weight gain? That's your test. But you get all these people that that confuse the issue. They're like, oh, but insulin uh, is an appetite suppressant in the CNS, in the central nervous system. Who cares? Who the f*** cares? Right? <laughs> no, I see. Oh, uh, insulin doesn't cause your appetite to go down. Who the f*** cares? <laughs> right? Is yeah. that my question? That's not my f- question, right? Uh, exactly. That's the whole point. If you mm. say insulin causes weight gain, do the test. Mm. Give insulin, do they gain weight? If it's yes, then that's your answer. Take it away. Do they lose weight? If the answer is yes, then that's your answer, right? And you can do the exact same thing with calories. If you think calories causes weight gain, do the overfeeding study. You feed them more calories, do they gain weight? Temporarily, yes. By the time you get out to six months, a year, all that weight goes down. That's force feeding. You force yeah. feed them, you know, food, they gain weight. But when you stop force feeding them, what happens? They go back to their original weight. So it didn't cause weight gain. And you do the same. If you think calories causes weight gain, take away calories. Does weight go down? Mm. And we know the answer to that. Every single one of us has done that mm. experiment. And the answer is, hell no, right? No. It doesn't work. Right. And it's not because people don't have willpower. It's because it doesn't work, right? So don't confuse the issue. Because I see posts all the time, like James Krieger and Stephen Guinea. They're yeah. like, oh, you know, insulin doesn't cause energy expenditure. Insulin doesn't cause appetite <sighs> suppressant. Insulin works like this in the CNS. If you give insulin to rats, I'm like, who the f*** cares? <laughs> like, don't be an 
this, right? Nice. Give insulin to people, see if they gain weight. Right. If it if they do, that's it, right? And don't make it more complicated than it has to be, right? And that's yeah. and laser, right? People try to yep. confuse you. Right. You've got to cut through all the kind of bullshit to get to the core, which mm. is if insulin causes weight gain, then insulin is the problem, right? Yeah. Now that sets you up very easily to say, well, what is going to influence my insulin? And it's not just carbohydrates, right? right? That's where I differ from some of the other people mm. with the carb insulin hypothesis, where, it, where they're saying that it's just carbs that causes insulin to go up and down. It's mm. not, mm. right? There's all kinds of other things that contribute because you can eat a very carb heavy diet and still have low insulin mm -hmm. if you play around with some of these other factors. Yeah, in fact, uh, I was looking through your some of your sample, you know, plans. I guess there's a couple of pages in the back of the in an appendix in the obesity code where, you know, a, a typical diet might look like this, you know, and, and you have said this is just one of many. But yeah, I noticed um yogurt with berries, uh, all bran, you know, um things that have carbohydrates in them and uh, you know it made me wonder that uh you know I, I guess if you're you're really lowering your insulin with a 24 hour fast then you can after a while tolerate these things i guess that does that make sense for somebody who's metabolically deranged like richard and i to me it's all about the insulin not about the carbohydrates sure right? so if you look at all brand for instance the actual how much insulin it stimulates is very low. So yeah, maybe carbohydrates, but it doesn't stimulate much insulin, right. right? So you have to look at an insulin index, not a glycemic index, for example, mm. or just a carb counting. Because to me, the problem is insulin, right? And one of the things that, so other than carbohydrates, it's mostly the refined carbohydrates, yeah. which are very, very stimulating to insulin. And we all get that sugar and white bread. Nobody kind of disagrees about the white bread and stuff right but the thing the other thing is insulin resistance is a large player because insulin resistance causes a lot of insulin to go up too so you got to take care of that and mm -hmm. intermittent fasting which deals with timing of meals is something that's kind of specifically for that rather than total calories right so it's about giving your body a chance to have low insulin levels for long enough that you don't get all this kind of resistance because in the long term, that resistance will play into hyperinsulinemia, which oh, will sure. play into weight gain. And that's why there's actually two important questions here, right? So there's the what to eat and there's the when to eat. And yeah. it turns out that we all talk about what to eat. You eat high fat, low fat, high carb, low carb. Um, uh, and we talk about it quite a bit. There's actually much more agreement than disagreement, right? You look at all those high carb studies it's not white bread and sugar right it's yeah. all like beans and you know all bran and stuff that, that looks really really like a, you would lose weight right um but it's not high carb in the way that most north americans eat high carb mm. which is mcdonald's and you know yeah. pizza hut jason what got you interested in the first place in um fasting as a therapy yeah um, fasting is interesting in that I actually started treating patients with low carb diets when I started. It was not successful. It was much too complicated for a lot of people. Really? And then I thought uh, for a little bit, I thought the point is not to lower carbs. The point is to lower insulin, right? Ah. So what's easier? for people to understand is fasting because it's, it, there's a traditional uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, heritage there in terms of people understanding from a religious, spiritual standpoint. Yeah. And also even from a health standpoint, but right? But did like it just, did it, you just lead, your just journey naturally led you to fasting? What was there, was there a moment when the light bulb went off? There was actually, and you know, I was talking to, I was talking to somebody and we we're talking kind of back and forth. And then we we're talking eventually about fasting. It was actually about a cleanse, which is similar to a fast, right? Except they try and sell you some expensive product right. <laughs> so that you can fast, right? Which I don't really believe in, but if no. it helps you, then great. Mm -hmm. So they're showing some great results. I thought fasting, Hey, that's really, really interesting. Um, and then I thought for a second, at first, I thought, well, that's really crazy, right? You yeah. know, fasting. I don't know about that, right? But then I thought, why not? 
right? People have done it for thousands of years. Right. Why can't we do it? Like, what's wrong with fasting? So then that's when I thought, this is interesting, right? Fasting, you're going to eat zero. So you're going to uh, lower your insulin levels maximally, right? Because yeah. all food does stimulate insulin to some degree, unless you eat almost pure fat, which most meals sure. are not. Uh, you will stimulate insulin to some degree from the protein, for example. But why not? What's wrong with it, right? And then I thought for a second, and I thought, okay, well, you know, it's been done for thousands of years, right? So there's that history there, which is important. So again, if you look at some of the uh, writings of like, you know, Nicholas Taleb, who wrote Anti-Fragile, he talks about these things where, um, you know, one of the things is that if, if, if something has withstood the test of time, right? You know, it's probably okay, right? Sure. Because if there was any problems with it, it would have been figured out a long, long time ago. I thought, mm. well, this is really interesting. Like, so you have diets like, I don't know, the HCG diet or whatever, and they're relatively new. They've been, people have been doing it for tens of years, not thousands of years, right? Yeah. And even low carb diets, the history goes back hundreds of years. So you know that it's been tried, it's been done. And um, this is not this is not just the latest, greatest fad diet, right? Like, you know, quinoa. It's like, oh, all of a sudden <laughs> you can't live without quinoa. But you know that people never right. ate quinoa like ever, right? right? For 2005 or something like that, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, or like, oh, you have to eat coconut oil. Well, you know, there's thousands of people Millions of people in the northern hemisphere oh, good point. who have lived for millions of years safely without coconut. Now, I love coconut, right? But mm. that's my point. You don't have to eat it. Or avocados, right? Like, okay, if I live in Canada, we don't grow avocados here. And yet mm. people were still healthy without that. So these things that are kind of the latest and greatest, yeah, there's their place. I love avocados. I love mm. um, coconut. But... Clearly, if they've withstood that test of time, then there's probably something to it. And that is one of the things that really struck me about the fasting is that we've done it for so many years. We, we, it, it, we know it's safe, for sure know it's safe. And yet, people have really demonized it. You can't miss a single meal ever, right? right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, that. The, and, and then when I read, started reading through some of the literature and stuff, I realized that uh, there's actually tons of uh, health benefits to it, mm -hmm. right? And that's what, so then, then I started using it in my clinics. And uh, I'll say that it's far more successful for me because I deal with many older patients. Maybe they don't understand English so well. They're really not the people on Facebook looking at nutrition studies, right? They yeah. are, you know, 65, 70 years old and they've lived a certain way their entire life. Mm. And they want to get better, yes. But, they, they, you know, they don't know the difference between a carb and a protein and a fat. Mm -hmm. Like, they just don't. They know what yeah. a potato is, but that's about it. You have to tell them <laughs> about foods and stuff. Do you but it's ease so people into fasting with, uh, with a, a low-carb, high-fat diet to ease the sort of the break-off point? Yeah, I think it does a lot better. So, ketogenic diets and also low-carb diets because your body's kind of adapted to fat burning already. Uh, anecdotally, the people who do it find a very easy transition. Whereas yeah. if you go from a regular diet into fasting, it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So not that you can't do it. Lots right. of people do it, but it's, it's, it's easier, uh, from that. And, and, and this is the thing, right? So even if you're on a ketogenic diet, it's, it's striking because it's like, you may not be hungry. And it's like, there's so many people, again, screaming at you. Hmm. Oh, if you're not hungry, you should eat. I'm like, that's not going to make you lose weight. Yeah. <laughs> right? If you're not hungry, you shouldn't be eating. That's your body telling you, don't put any food in your mouth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And yet, these experts all over the place, especially the universities, like they're just the worst, these university people. They really are clueless for the most part. Too much brain, not enough heart. <laughs> well, you know, they think they're right, but the problem is that they don't have any real world experience. Mm. So they keep insisting that you do it their way because they don't know that they're wrong. And yeah. it's interesting because I work in the community 
And I'll tell you that there's a number of other community doctors who do obesity medicine and so on. Every single one of them uses a low carb diet. Why? Because it works. Like those people who use low calorie diets, you're either out of business or you're so unsuccessful that you're going to do something else. Sorry, Dr. Fung, we're running a little bit short on time, but we want you to participate in this next bit that we call Mail! 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 Jason, I hope you don't mind answering a few questions. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Awesome. Uh, so this one is uh, from Matthew, and he says, at what point, days or hours, do you get diminishing returns on fasting? Do fat fasts like cream and coffee, bone broth, etc., hinder results versus zero calorie fast? And is there too long of a fast that causes a decrease in metabolism? Those are a few off the top of my head, he says. So fat fasts are where you have fat and nothing else. So the whole point of fasting, the whole a lot of the benefits, but not all benefits, come from lowering insulin. So if you take pure fat like butter, like bulletproof coffee, then you're going to have just fat and very little insulin response despite the fact that you're taking a lot of calories, right? So MCT oil, coconut oil, or adding butter, it's a lot of calories but very little insulin response, which means that you actually get almost all of the benefits of the fasting without actually fasting. Okay, so there's a lot of people say, is it a fast? Well, technically, no. Technically, fasting is like nothing, zero and zero, right? But there's variation. So the fat fast is one that I think should give very good results. And I think a lot of people have had excellent results with Bulletproof Coffee, for example, which is probably the most popular here in Canada, in, in North America right yeah. now. You could use other things. We, we allow cream and coffee and so on. Bone broth is different. It's not fat. It has protein. So it does have some insulin response. When we use that for uh, longer fasts, so more extended fasts, uh, we sometimes use it also for the shorter ones, the alternate daily fast, but the, 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 the reasoning is slightly different. So it is going to stimulate insulin. It does have some protein. For extended fast, you, it does two things. One, because of the protein, you have a lower um, risk of refeeding syndromes, which can be an issue if, if you're going very long. So I'm talking 7, 14 days sort of deal, which we do sometimes. Uh, and the second thing is it allows you to take enough salt because on the longer fast, you may actually become quite salt depleting, mostly not problem. Some people take salt and water, which sounds really gross, except until you're really salt depleted, then apparently it tastes wonderful. I yeah. do that <laughs> and it works great. Yeah. yeah. So you get headaches, people get headaches and cramps if you don't get enough salt. So you can have problems But the bone broth does that. And so it has a lot of things, but no, it's not a true fast, but sure. We have enough experience to say that most people get the benefits without doing a true fast, and you should do it, right? It's a trade-off here, and, yeah. and I'm not a purist in that I say, oh, you must drink water only for 14 days. If the fasting gives you most of the benefits but makes it 50% easier, that's a good trade-off, mm, sure. right? Because it's a trade-off for sure, and the fact is the same. If you want to – cream in your coffee if you want to take bulletproof coffee and it makes the fasting a lot easier and slightly less effective it's a good trade-off right yeah. and, and those are the kind of things you have to play with now if you're not getting the results that you want and or you hate it uh you know the the bone broth then don't do it go to a classic water only fast or herbal tea or something like that something with really zero calories right so sure. that's the variations and you have to see what which which one you are everybody's different so if you do it and it does terribly for you you don't lose any weight and all this stuff then don't do it do a classic one yeah um in, in returns uh in terms of weight loss they have done studies and the rate of weight loss actually persists for quite some time until you get to a certain point in your body fat where it drops below a certain percentage. So mm -hmm. that percentage is probably less than 10, but it's actually probably closer to like 7%, something like that. That's yeah. extremely low body fat, right? right. So most yeah. people average is somewhere around 25, 30%. Uh, if you're obese, it can creep up towards 50% actually. So it's a lot, there's, there's a long way to go before you see those diminishing returns. Yeah, there's a there's a limit to how much fat, how how many calories you can pull out of a of a pound of fat, right? There's like uh, 31 calories that you can pull out per day of a pound of fat. So the less fat you have, the less energy you've got access to. 
Um, I'm not really sure. Like, I'm not really sure I agree with that study. I mean, they're saying that there's a maximum fat flux that is, it can only uh, give you so much energy. Therefore, the rest has to come from protein. But that's not what you see when you study. And I don't know if that was a rat study or a human study, but uh, that's not what you see clinically, right? So when you look at what happens to people as they fast for extended periods, you get almost all, so carbohydrate oxidation goes down very low. You get a bit of protein, but it doesn't spike up, right? You're not increasing the amount of protein you're burning. You're still burning protein, right? There's a normal turnover, but it doesn't go up to burn for energy. All that goes up is fat oxidation, which is great. So, you know, the, the, the whole of this whole idea, there's a maximum amount, uh, kind of flies in the face of logic because there are people who fast for 90 days so online you can see these forums of people who decide to fast for 90 days and you read the testimonials and stuff and they're like yeah i feel terrific and stuff and you know they're clearly burning almost the same number of calories right for their basal metabolism that they were before so there, you know, this is what I mean, like to take one study and to say, oh, well, you will only burn this amount. Therefore, the rest is coming from protein. Uh, it doesn't jive with the actual facts when you actually see it. Right. It's the same people who say, oh, bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly. We've proved it with our physics. And there <laughs> they are flying around. It's like, oh, yeah, you got to know who to trust. Well, do you trust the people who are doing it or do you trust the people who aren't doing it? But they say you shouldn't do it, right? It's like, uh, you know, you can choose which one. We you trust want. you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question from Brenda Zorn, and she does intermittent fasting. She has a two hour feeding window. So she fasts for 22 hours during most days, and then she feeds for two hours during the day. And her question is that her daily protein requirement uh, is about 100 grams and, and, and folks are always freaking out on her that she eats all of that in one meal and that it can kick her out of ketosis. Um, she doesn't actually have a blood ketone meter, so she doesn't really know, but she doesn't seem to have a problem with high blood glucose and she continues to lose the weight. So she's really asking, does Dr. Fung have a recommendation for maximum protein in one meal? I mean, can you eat all of the protein that your your body appears to need for maintenance? Can you eat all of that in one to our window? Uh, I think you can. I mean, if it, it does it kick you out of ketosis? Possibly, but you don't have to be in ketosis to lose weight, right? right. And you don't have to be in ketosis to do well. It's one way to do well, but it's not the only way. So if she's doing well and doing it this way, then do, do it, right? If you stop doing well, then you may have to rethink it. The whole awesome. idea about protein is um, I think that We've gone to this idea that more protein is good. I'm not sure that's actually true. Um, I think that you need a certain amount of protein, but the amount of protein actually necessary, I think, is actually quite low. And you can look at traditional societies who eat, you know, 70% carbohydrates, like the Okinawans and stuff, 70% carbohydrates. You know, the traditional Chinese, which was rice and vegetables and stuff very limited amount of animal protein and animal protein is more bioavailable. So, you know, they take, do take some vegetable protein, but not a lot of protein. And I think that the amount of protein that we eat, uh, all of us in North America is actually probably three or four times what we actually need. Hmm. And is it good or is it bad? That's the whole question. I actually think it's bad. So Dr. Ron Rosedale had given a talk at the last, um, low carb meeting at Vail, which was really very interesting. And he was uh, saying, if he comes to a low carb meeting and says, he thinks the protein is as bad as the carbohydrates, right? It's mm. like, that's an interesting way of thinking, although I agree with it because um, that excess protein, of course, gets turned into glucose. You can't store protein as a storage form of energy. So it mm. gets turned into glucose and then eventually into fat. So I think that one, yes, you can take all that protein. Does it kick you out of ketosis? Possibly, but it matters very little. What matters in the end is getting the results that you want. So if you're losing weight and it is kicking you out of ketosis, why do I care? Right? I don't really. I only, yeah. the point is not to be in ketosis. The point is to lose weight and feel well, right? So you know that you're feeling well. You know that you're losing weight. Sure. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Are you getting enough protein? Your body will tell you when you're not getting enough protein, 
right? You'll 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 notice it. How does it do that? Why well, your your body breaks down proteins into amino acids, right? And when you eat protein, it's amino acids. So you got to think the only way that you can actually become deficient in protein is if you're losing it out of your body, which is your urine and your stools, without replenishing it, right? So when your protein, when your amino acids go down, you are still going to break down protein, but almost all of that gets reclaimed through the urine and through the stools. Like, again, why would the body be so stupid as to break down these proteins into amino acids, excrete them, and then say, hey, I have no amino acids coming in, and then, you know, kill yourself, right? It's like, hey, that doesn't make any sense. You'd never have survived that way, right? So your body will know. It'll start to reclaim all its protein, and people have survived on extremely low-protein diets. I mean, look at all the uh, Japanese prisoners of war and World War II kind of thing, right? Even when they got calories, it wasn't protein, right? They weren't getting a hamburger. They were getting right. some more rice, right? Yeah, this is great. And uh, totally digging your answers here, but we got a couple more I'd like to get to. Okay. All right. Karen, Karen Mangiacotti says, I would like to know about the headaches. I have done broth and salt water and supplements, electrolyte supplements, and I still can't fast without a headache. Have you seen anything like that in your practice? Headaches very common. So we do try to warn people about them before they start. And it usually goes away. But I had them myself when I started. Mm -hmm. we, we notice it all the time with patients. I don't know why, but it happens all the time. Some people actually get migraines, mm -hmm. which are even more severe. So we tell people to give it some time because, um, Usually as you get kind of keto adapted and so on, the headaches do tend to go away. Uh, staying hydrated is one thing, making sure all your electrolytes. So it sounds like she's doing all the right things. Um, and for the most part, that's what, that's what we notice is that it just goes away. Uh, if it doesn't, then there's two choices. You can either kind of cut back your fasting into a shorter uh, time slot. So 20 sure. hours, 16 hours, whatever you can tolerate. Right. So you yeah. have people who do 16, eight all the time and do very well. Right. Um, but the other option is to do an extended fast, which is really kind of, you know, almost shock therapy. You force your body to make the adaptation to fasting. Yeah. You have the headache for a day or so you take some Tylenol and then usually after that, it goes away. So what is the best, what is the best period for an extended fast i mean i've heard that a lot of the benefits start to kick in at about 24 hours but we we tend to go for three hours i mean uh, th sorry three days but what is the ideal time the, i'll tell you the worst extended fast is about 48 hours and the reason is that much of the hunger peaks at day two so and everybody says this day two yeah. is the worst day Day yeah. three is a bit better. Day four is better than that. Day five is better than that. By day six, they say, oh, I can go on forever like this, right? And that's what the, the secret of the hunger strikes are, right? They do these 30-day sure. fasts for hunger strikes, and the people go, how are you going to do it? Well, by day five, they could go on indefinitely. Why? Because their body is now fully adapted. They're basically eating their own fat, right? And that's it. So their metabolism is normal. They feel normal. They function normally. And every day, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner is your own fat, which is great. Does the body actually get nutrients, micronutrients from your body fat? Like you need the micronutrients. And we, we generally have people take a general multivitamin on extended fast, right? So okay. most of the nutrients, again, it's the same. If you're talking about, say, zinc, your body will start to reclaim it after a while. But you don't want to get into a situation where you're worried about vitamin deficiency. Yeah, so we right. have people take a multivitamin. They're cheap. They're available everywhere, right? Sure. And it's easy. It's not hard on the stomach for the most part. Not to take the calcium. Sometimes that causes a problem and the iron sometimes mm. too. But the, the whole point of the extended fast is that if day two is your worst day, then if you do a two-day fast, you're going to get the brunt of it without getting all the rest of the easy yeah, days, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that doesn't make any sense from us. So we often go 5 to 7, 14, 21 kind of thing because wow. we know that day two is bad. But if you break it at day kind of day two, uh, you're – you know, day two is a day that you think you'll never be able to make it, right? Day three, you think, hey, I can do this. 
Day four is ah, it's not so bad. Day five is like that. This, this, this is like normal. <laughs> yeah. It's great. So that's why we always say five to seven days is a pretty good thing to enter for. By the time you hit, you know, ten days and more, you have to start to be a little bit careful about refeeding syndromes, which is where when you start to eat, you know, there's too many changes and you don't feel so good. Your phosphorus level drops. The bone broth helps kind of mitigate that a bit. If you're very over, like if you're very kind of, if you're average weight or underweight, those longer fasts can, you know, be a bit more of a problem. So by the time you hit 10 to 14 days, you're starting to worry about those things. Plus you have to be much more careful in terms of breaking your fast, that you have to don't go too fast. And every single person has done this. They, they break their fast and then they eat a lot because psychologically there's this thinking that, yeah, and they get a big stomach ache, right? They, or diarrhea. That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So every single person gets that and they very quickly learn that you have to be gentle on these long fasts. So when you get to that kind of 10 to 14 day range, that's when you have to be careful. So with the extended fast, we typically uh, center mostly into that kind of 5 to 10 day, 5 to 14 day range. For people with very severe diabetes, we say it's good to take a break for a while, then do it again. And that's the whole point. But yeah, I would say that's the kind of sweet spot. Just avoid the two-day fast because it's just psychologically the hardest one to do. And it's interesting in terms of the hunger. One, it's that's what people always say. And the studies show the same thing. If you look at ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, peaks at day two. Every day after that, it goes down and down and down. We find that hour 18 is particularly hard. Yeah. All of us in the group have, have mentioned hour 18. Yeah, it, it, it is absolutely true because if you look at the ghrelin again, it goes up and up and up, right? 18 starts to get hard, but the hunger comes in waves, right? You see the same thing. You let it go, like say, you know, by hour 18 or 24, you're wanting dinner, but you don't have it. It passes. Then you go, and then you feel pretty normal. You go to sleep, right? Mm. But then that whole next day, it's still high, right? That second day is still a tough day, right? So you don't want to cut it. That's the day that you don't think you can make it, right? But that you don't want to cut it just as you've gotten over the hump. Sure. One of the guys in our group has mentioned a, a tip, which is if you start at lunch, you know, you have an early lunch, like 11 o'clock. By the time hour 18 comes around, you're asleep. So you miss it. You miss your first hunger wave. That's a good tip. Actually, I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, that is a very good tip because it is definitely true. And you see this and, you know, if it's, uh, you know, if, if that, uh, that works, then yeah. perfect. But the whole next day, day two is always still a very difficult one for everybody. And, you know. Well, Jason, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us here. It's been an extreme pleasure for both of us. Oh, thank you very much. This is great. Thanks, Jason. Heard you say you are due for a little how outstanding was that? The Fast Master. The Fast Master. I, you know, he's inspired me. I think I'm going to yeah. do an, an open-ended fast. No. Yeah. How long? I, who knows? As long as I can go. Wow. Yeah. We'll see. It might only last three days. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know you can do that. You can do that on your head. So yeah. you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Much respect. Much respect. <laughs> and now that I'm fasting, let's talk about recipes. 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 <laughs> This is one of the problems with the Two Keto Dudes Facebook group is that it is. people are fasting and then other people post all these great pictures of, you know. I know, right? <laughs> makes them it's hungry. Outstanding. It's outstanding. It's always half of the group is fasting, the other half of the group is eating. <laughs> right. So we have this unwritten protocol, which is if you're going to post pictures of food, really good food, the first thing you do is say, uh, warning, you know, food porn, imminent, yeah. Uh, yeah. pictures are in the comments. I, th I think I followed that rule once. I do apologize for everybody, yeah. but I just like, I blurt out something awesome I've just eaten. <laughs> I do it all the time too. I'm going to try to be a better person though. Richard, what do you got? You remember I did uh, a uh, versatile tomato sauce, uh, which I'd freeze into ice cube trays. Yeah. Julie's tomato sauce, low carb style. Yeah. Well, I've got a very simple recipe for taking that and turning it into barbecue sauce. Great. 
And you know I'd uh, take a, a shoulder of uh, lamb or beef and, or pork and I'd uh, slow cook it and pull it and then uh, store it in the freezer so I'd have a little baggy a freezer bag of pulled meat ready to go. Yeah. So this – this barbecue sauce, basically what I do is I throw that pulled meat into the microwave to defrost it, throw it into a pan with a little bit of oil and add my barbecue sauce to it and basically end up with an unctuous, pulled, slow-cooked nice. barbecue meat oh, man. in about five, minute, five minutes. That yeah. for a meal, plus normally I'd have some fennel salad in the fridge. I'd make some of these meals in like five minutes and they would feel like they'd been cooked for hours. And in fact, they had, but it was a lot of prep work. And if you listen back to the cooking show, you'll hear all our techniques for doing this. You need a, yeah. a vacuum sealer and you need a yep. freezer, but yep. you can spend one day a month cooking and make all of this great food and chop it up right. into portions and put it in the freezer. And now you're five minutes away from a really, really healthy meal. And tasty. Tasty. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So, uh, so this two minute barbecue sauce. Basically, what I do is I take two of my uh, my ice cubes of uh, tomato sauce that I've that I've pre made. Mm -hmm. Now, I sometimes put those tomatoes in the smoker. If I've got a rack left over in my hot smoker, yeah. I'll put a muffin tray full of halves of uh, of Roman tomatoes, mm -hmm. um, and I'll end up with smoked tomatoes to make my tomato puree. But nice. you don't have to do that to make this barbecue sauce. Yeah, but it's really nice if you do. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. So, so I I basically get a. Uh, I get two cubes of my low-carb tomato sauce. I get a cube of brown chicken stock. Now, you know that I make the brown chicken stock and freeze it in the ice cube tray. Right. So, again, same kind of mechanism. And then I get a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce. Love Worcestershire. Now, it has it, – it has a little bit of carbs, not too many, mm. but you're only having a very small amount. But it just gives you that barbecue smoky yeah. flavor. Um, I also add in uh, some Splendor. Now, I sometimes I'll use maybe a, a – a, a teaspoon of the cooking splendor or three or four tabs of splendor. Mm. Um, you have to sweeten it yeah. because the other thing we're going to add to it is apple cider vinegar, about, yeah. a, a, about a, a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. And so you're basically getting the balance of the smoky flavor, the umami sort of flavors of the tomato, the sweet flavor that's produced by the splendor, and then the sour flavor by the Apple cider vinegar, yeah. And if you happen to have drippings from any meat that you've made, oh yeah, you got to yeah. add that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Fond on the bottom of the pan, but so, so, so you, you basically mix these up, and you basically you're making a small batch. Maybe, maybe it's about a half a cup worth of sauce, and you throw that on two hundred grams of uh, pulled smoked meat yeah. that you've uh, defrosted, and and it's. You end up with a with a an unctuous, sweet, umami flavored, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. awesome piece of smoked. Isn't meat. it funny how we crave savory stuff and not sweet stuff now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Even though I've just given you a sweet recipe. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's not all sweet though. It's complex. No, it's got the it umami. Is. It's got the, the yeah. The those savory, sweet, those yeah, those savory protein flavors. Yeah. yeah. So that's my recipe is uh, a barbecue, uh, two minute barbecue sauce. It's on my blog, and uh, go, you know, go for it. Awesome. So, what have you got, Carl? Well, I did a failed experiment, and I'm not going to okay. talk about that. I was going to talk about that. It was a brisket, and a, mm. a, it was a brisket recipe that you smoke on the grill with a with a, a, a smoker box. Right. And the reason it failed is because you're supposed to keep the temperature at 225 degrees Fahrenheit. And unfortunately, even just lighting one burner and keeping the brisket on the complete other side of the grill, right. I was only able to ignite the chips, which were soaked properly overnight, hickory sure. chips in a box, if, if it was up at 300 degrees, if it was on full. And so right. what happened is it got overcooked, it got dried Too off out. the meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to talk about that. And I will try the uh, the other 
way to cook brisket on the grill, which is only smoke it for a half hour or so, and then finish it in the oven. Yeah, I, I do it for about a half hour to get the that smoke ring coming in. Yeah, really heavy smoke environment, and try to keep it as cool the the meat as cool as possible right. so that it's not cooking in there and rendering fat. And then I put it in the oven. and I can get a low temperature so that I can just yeah. get I can just get it to the right temp. So yeah. But the reason I brought it up is because interestingly enough, I made a barbecue sauce with the drippings that are exactly. Your barbecue oh, wow. sauce, exactly the same ingredients. No yeah. <laughs> I had a little tomato sauce. I had the drippings yep. from the brisket, which included the rub. Yep. And the rub was, you know, salt, garlic powder, onion powder, cumin, nice. a little smoked paprika. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And some xylitol, which is my sweetener of choice. Sure. And some salt yep. and pepper. And that went all over it. And then I took the drippings mm. of that and basically did exactly what you said. You would have had to because your meat was dry. So you would have had to have yeah. made a sauce to, yeah, to make it palatable. Yeah. I started by putting water in the bottom of the drip pan, about, oh, yeah. a, about yeah, two yeah. cups of water, which sort of yeah. evaporated a little bit, but I got all the drippings yeah. in there, added the tomato sauce, added the apple cider vinegar, mm. added even more of the xylitol. And then right. apple cider vinegar and 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 liquid smoke. Or or you can actually smoke your tomatoes, you know. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Thing. That's even better. <laughs> so I reduced that down to a really, really thick sauce, and that was wonderful. All right. Mm. Here's my recipe, kids. Okay. This is good stuff. I told you about Cooks Illustrated. Yep. America's Test Kitchen. And Cooks Illustrated is one of their magazines. And uh, Cook's Country is another one. They're not low carb. They're not keto, but they do have really good culinary suggestions. And sometimes the recipes are adaptable. Sure. In this case, it's the best beef stew. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. There's a secret to their best beef stew. Now, when we talk about umami, which is the Japanese mm -hmm. word that means that you use unctuous, right? It's that yes, savory yeah. flavor that gets you right in the back of the throat, you know, that really rich, meaty flavor. So I think it's glutamate. Yeah. That's the actual uh, reaction that's actually happening. Yeah. Exactly. So the secret ingredient in Cook's Illustrated Beef Stew, which I borrowed from my recipe, are, mm -hmm. is three ingredients. Tomato paste. Okay. Crushed garlic. Mm -hmm. And anchovies. Anchovies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, anchovies. that'll do it. <laughs> What's great about anchovies is they have so much of that glutamate. Yeah. And yet, if you, you just chop them up real fine, you don't taste fish. No. It's like in a Caesar dressing. That's the thing that That's adds, right. makes a Caesar dressing so tasty. Yeah. yeah. This was an amazing discovery. And so here's the recipe. You ready for this? Uh, mm -hmm. And this is a purely keto, low carb, high fat recipe. So you take three tablespoons of olive oil. You're going to use two at first, and then you're going to save one to, to mix with xanthan gum later to thicken. Mm -hmm. You need a four pound beef chuck roast Get okay. it with all the fat on. Get it in one piece. Don't get it sliced up. You want to just go to your butcher and say, give me a four pound chuck roast. Four ounces of salt pork. Salt pork is another one of those umami flavors, but rinse okay. off the extra salt because you're really just interested. You're not in, not in all the salt from the salt pork, but that flavor of salt pork. Mm. Okay. Uh, you're going to season it with four tablespoons or so of onion powder. You might use a little more if you need to. You can use onions if you like, but onion powder is more concentrated and there's less sure. carbs. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I use it. I find it's a different flavor. It's a different flavor profile from onions. Onions are hotter, sharper, and yep. I, I like that sort of like a mellow. It's almost like a roast onion flavor. Yeah, almost. it's a roasted so, onion yeah, flavor. Like exactly. That. That's why I like it. Uh, so you need also two cups of red wine, two cups of low salt mm -hmm. chicken broth, or you can use the bone broth. If you're using bone broth, when you salt and pepper to taste, you're obviously going to add less salt, right? Yeah. Uh, a couple of bay leaves, four sprigs or more of fresh thyme, because thyme in beef stew is timeless, yep. really. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and xanthan gum or guar gum or some other low-carb thickener. I've seen people use gelatin. Yeah. I use I use xanthan because it, it holds up to heat really well. Uh, agar is another one if you, you really want it to get solid. but um, right. the, Or you use guar gum, I think, for more cold yeah, uh, and gelatin for things that you want to set in cold. So yep. So xanthan yeah. gum is what I use, and you yeah, can yeah. find it online too. It's no big deal. Yeah. So here's what you do: on a stove top, you get a big, you know, three two gallon saucepan, some sort of big pot, mm. right? 
You can use the Dutch oven if you like. Yeah. And uh, put two tablespoons of olive oil in the bottom and cut up your uh, chuck roast into cubes. Sure. And this is going to take you a while. <laughs> if you, you know, don't, don't worry about trimming the fat, just make, you know, bite-sized cubes out of this thing. Take half of it and put it in the oil because only half will sort of coat the bottom at one time. Right. And, and brown them on medium heat for about seven or eight minutes till they're yeah. browned. Take them off the heat, throw the other half in, brown that for about seven minutes, bring the first half back to the pot and now what you're going to do is add your mixture of crushed garlic, chopped anchovy fillets, chopped really fine, and the tablespoon of tomato paste all mixed up together. And just add that and swirl it around and coat all of the meat with mm. it. All mm. right? Nice. So it's almost a marinade now. It's for the meat. Yeah. yeah. And now you just sort of let that cook for another few minutes. And now you add your red wine. Two cups of red wine. Right. You could think of it as deglazing the bottom of the pan, although there's not much glaze there, to be honest. You know, you're just adding the wine. You want to let that cook down a little bit so that the alcohol has a chance to escape. But let's face it, it's going to cook for a long time. So don't worry about yeah. the alcohol remaining. You can feed yeah. it to kids. It's not going to be, they're not going to get mm. loopy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now you add your two cups of either low salt chicken broth or bone broth or whatever chicken broth you like. And and yes, I'm using chicken broth with beef stew. Don't yeah. use water and bouillon. It's all just salt. There's no flavor yeah. there. If you yeah. have beef stock, by all means, use it. But chicken stock works really well. You're going to get a lot of beef flavor from this. Yeah, I use chicken stock in just about everything. I'll use a beef stock if I'm making a beef a beef soup. Or yeah. something like that, where I want a really obviously beef flavor. But yeah. for the most part, uh, we always have a couple of liters of chicken stock in the fridge at all times. Yeah, it makes a nice contrast. Yeah. All right. So now um, add your bay leaves and your thyme, and basically you're going to let that simmer for quite a long time. Now, f some beef stew you make in a Dutch oven and you put it in the oven, like in a 300 degree oven, and just let it warm up and, and heat up and cook for a while. But I find just simmering it over really low heat, like for four hours or so, is really, mm. really good. Yeah. Nice. You're going to get it to reduce down a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. And now after a few hours, maybe four hours, maybe five hours, it's reduced down a little bit. It's got the right flavor profile that you like, you know, taste it, salt, pepper yeah. to taste. Yeah. Add pepper if it needs pepper. Add salt if it needs salt. And now you take the tablespoon of xanthan gum and a tablespoon of olive oil and stir them up cold. And you're gonna turn okay. the you're gonna turn the heat off hmm. on your beef stew because if the stew is too hot when you put in the xanthan gum, it's going to turn into little pebbles of goo. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you get right. the rolling heat off. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Get the rolling heat. Let it sit out on the counter for a good hour. Mm. And now you're basically just going to drizzle that xanthan gum olive oil thing in and whisk it really good. Whisk it, whisk it, yeah. whisk it, whisk it, whisk it, whisk it's it. It's incredible how quickly xanthan gum just, yes. it gels up. You think, oh, I'm, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. Oh, I've got too yeah. much. Yeah. That's right. So you have to be really <laughs> yeah. careful. You can't, can't yeah. use too much. And I think a tablespoon is a good place to start with, yeah, with this. It, it just thickens it a little bit so that. You know, it's got that rich, meaty, thick consistency yeah. and great flavor. Yeah, the traditional way would have been to flour the beef before you start browning it off, and right. you you and and so if you look at a traditional recipe, it says uh, coat your beef with flour and then right. brown it off and then start your soup. That starts the thickening from right from the get go. Right, uh, but in a low carb. Well, we don't obviously don't want to add flour unnecessarily to a right. to a meal. We don't want, really want it at all. So, xanthan gum does this, but you have to add it at the end. You can't add it at the right. beginning because you know you'll you'll break the you'll break the gel. So yep, yeah, exactly. Mm. So this is my go to recipe for beef stew. I've fed it to my family for six years or so, and <laughs> and they never complained that it didn't have flour in it. Right, they love it.
Yeah. That's yeah. a good recipe. That sounds almost like that, that combination of anchovies and garlic and tomato sounds almost like there's an old Roman recipe for making a sauce called garum, which is a sauce they added to everything. And they used, uh, they used rotten sardines and tomatoes and to make this sauce of theirs. So yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, and I can imagine there's a real umami flavor to it. Yeah. There was a urban legend that the Phoenicians, I think, had a rotten fish sauce. That they used like ketchup, but it uh, yeah, had, right. It had a different name to it, mm. but uh, ah well. That sounds outstanding. That sounds like a really delicious stew. So that's a show. We'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jason Fung for coming on, and definitely uh, we we'll, we should hear from him again. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, or some more research that you found to support or refute anything we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website or come and hang out on the Facebook forum and tell us off. Right. And you can get to the Facebook forum at fb.twoketo.com. Hey, a couple more links here. You can get to all our recipes by going to recipes.2keto.com. And if you're looking for a quick, concise list of research supporting the ketogenic diet, links.2keto.com. Of course, follow us on Twitter at 2KetoDudes and on Instagram at 2KetoDudes. We post pictures of food there that we don't necessarily share with the rest of the world <laughs> and other things. We do. And uh, Jason, why don't you take us out? <laughs> Go fast yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, booyah. We'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Yeah.